you guys hear me now? Yeah. Yay, okay, awesome. All right, so um, talking about an algorithm to extend common dimensionality reduction techniques to the case of neural sequences. So by sequence, uh, I mean a pattern of neural activity that lasts a short amount of time. So this could be a sparse sort of sin-fire sequence or any sequence that uh, fires in a similar way um, multiple times and lasts a short amount of time. So sequences are a very common feature of neural uh, circuits and they're also very important for neural function. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna tell you how our algorithm, which we call SeqNMF, works, and I'm gonna give you a sense of whether it might be applicable to your data sets, and then I'm gonna leave you with some uh, tools to try it um, that Andrew and I have posted on the FeeLab uh, GitHub account, and we also have a bioarchive preprint, so it should be very easy to try these uh, techniques if you'd like. Um, so I also study bird song. Um, this is a young bird, I study uh, early stages of learning, and um, I specifically study HVC, uh, which, is, uh, which forms sequences when the bird sings, and these sequences uh, generate song. So I'm interested in uh, what's happening in HVC very early on in the learning uh, process. And I'm using functional calcium imaging to record in HVC. So I wanted to look directly at the neural activity and extract structure from that without relying on looking at the noisy song behavior, which was changing a lot during learning. So here's an example of what uh, my data looks like. This is calcium imaging from about 100 neurons in HBC as a young bird is singing. So we extract calcium activity traces from these neurons using algorithms developed by the Paninsky lab and get data that looks like this. So here, um, each row is recording from a different neuron over time, and there are about 100 neurons. Cool. Um, and so our goal, oops, sorry, wrong way. Our goal here is to identify patterns that occur in this data, and also the times at which these patterns might occur. And I'm gonna show you the algorithm running uh, and, uh, but before I get into how exactly it works, and as it's running, I'm gonna resort the, the neurons according to their position in each of the patterns that are being extracted. So it's the same matrix I showed, just resorting, and you can see that we've extracted three different patterns which occur at particular points. And this makes a lot more sense than the original uh, picture where they're just in an arbitrary order. And now if we look back at the song the bird was singing, here's a spectrogram of the song frequencies by time, you can see that each of these neural sequences correlates with a particular type of feature in the bird song, even though it's a very noisy juvenile song. Okay, so how does this work? First, I'm gonna explain non-negative matrix factorization. So in this case, we have recordings from n neurons at t time points, and we want to identify synchronous patterns of activity. So find repeating patterns w, and the times at which these patterns occur, to decompose this entire matrix. And so let's say, uh, sorry, one other thing to mention is that it's similar to PCA or SVD, it's just forced to be, uh, that everything needs to be positive. So let's say that we have a second pattern in our data. We can extract a second pattern, the times at which that pattern occurs, and reconstruct our entire data matrix as the sum of reconstructions of each of these two patterns. And so this works very well when we have synchronous patterns of activity. But it doesn't work well when we have data like this where um, the patterns of activity occur over a short amount of time. Because here, NMF would pull out a different feature for each neuron, so we wouldn't have reduced the dimensionality at all. 
So um, luckily, we can just generalize it to cases where uh, the pattern lasts a short amount of time. It's a similar picture. Now, this pattern is convolved with this temporal uh, activity to produce the data matrix. And this um, was developed by Paris Maragdis and is called convolutional NMF. So here, we can also generalize to multiple temporal patterns and factorize the data in this way. So this algorithm, algorithm is really great and very, almost um, exactly what I wanted for my data. Um, it's fairly easy to fix, fit by minimizing this cost function. You can find the patterns and time courses um, that best fit your data, minimizing reconstruction error. But it has a problem because in practice it gives you redundant factors. Um, so here's an example of a redundant factorization. The data has just one sequence, but we've extracted two different patterns corresponding to the first part and the second part of this sequence. And so what we noticed is that in this case, there's a high degree of correlation between these redundant factors. So we wanted to add a term to the cost function which punishes correlations between factors. And the first thing that we thought of to do was um, punishing the correlation matrix HH transpose. And this has been done in standard NMF and works pretty well. But in this case, it doesn't work because if you notice these two time courses are correlated but at a slight temporal offset. So this term is completely insensitive to this type of correlation. So we thought maybe we could add a smoothing term to the H's before we took the correlation matrix. So then we could be sensitive to correlations at a slight temporal offset. This almost worked, but not quite, because what would happen is that we'd get two different factors where the patterns look very similar, they would just explain different instances of the same sequence in the data. So that doesn't quite work, but we added um, uh, an extra term which is the overlap of each pattern with the data. So now instead of HH transpose, it's the overlap times H transpose. And this is sensitive to the type of correlations that um, we saw in these redundant factorizations. So this worked really well. Um, here's an example of simulated data, neurons by time with two different sequences that happen at different times. And we we're able to extract two different um, patterns and, it, and when those patterns occurred. And we consistently get this answer each time we run it. So if we run our algorithm without the regularizer, so if we run traditional convolutional NMF, then um, we get highly inconsistent factorizations. We get a different redundancy each time we run it. It's hard to interpret. If we regularize, then almost all the time we get exactly the same answer, which we know is the right answer because we simulated this data. Um, we're also able to test the significance of each factor that we extracted on held out data. Um, and so let's say we, we extracted this factor in a different data set and wanted to see whether that factor is present in held out data. We pass the pattern over the data and see if there are moments of exceptionally high overlap. And we can compare this to a case where we shuffle the factors, um, shuffle the timing of these neurons and assess the significance. And using this, we were able to test whether SeqNMF could correctly determine the number of sequences in simulated data sets. So we simulated data sets with one through 10 sequences, and we measured how many significant factors SeqNMF extracted. And almost all the time, SeqNMF extracts the correct number of factors. If we didn't regularize, all of the factors would be full, and they'd be very redundant. So that's useful. Um, we also test whether SeqNMF is robust to noise. So we broke this into four different categories of noise that are common to neural sequences. So you might have neurons that um, only probabilistically participate in the sequence. They sometimes miss a cycle. 
You might have additive noise where neurons randomly fire out of sequence. You might have temporal jitter where neurons um, fire at a slight offset in each instance of the sequence. And also, the entire sequence might be warped on each instance by a different amount. And in each of these cases, SeqNMF was able to extract sequences that are similar to the ground truth data without noise. And in the case of some temporal noise, the, se the extracted sequences looked a little bit blurred, sort of like an average of the different cases. So um, we also wondered how should we choose the strength of our regularization term? There's really a trade-off here between how well we're fitting our data and how correlated our reconstructions are. So we tested on um, a lot of simulated data where we knew the ground truth and found that if we picked a value of lambda that was slightly over this crossover point of a trade-off between reconstruction error and correlation cost, then we would get the right answer for the right number of sequences. So now we're ready to try our algorithm on real data. We tried it on data from uh, the Buzaki lab in animals doing an alternating left-right task with, with a delay on a running wheel. And without any reference to the behavior, we extracted three sequences corresponding to three parts of the task. So here I'm showing the extracted sequences and I'm sorting the neurons according to their latencies within each sequence. And now I'm showing the reconstruction of the data based on factor one, factor two, factor three the times at which each sequence occurred in the data, and also the raw data uh, sorted in the same way according to each factor. So you can see these factors are alternating um, according to the structure of the task, and this is a common sequence because the animal will run along a common um, stem of the T maze. So this was exciting, and it, it had extracted, as I showed before, um, calcium imaging bird data, firing rates from the hippocampus. We also tried it on song spectrograms that we had in the lab, which is a much denser pattern than the type of um, sequences found in HBC and in the hippocampus. And when we run SeqNMF on song spectrograms that usually need to be hand-labeled, um, in the case of juvenile birds, SeqNMF was able to extract factors that closely matched our previously published hand-labeled syllables, and it even identified an extra factor corresponding to a syllable we weren't sure how to label previously. Um, so it works uh, quite well, as I showed you on the hippocampus, and I think it could work on a lot of um, awesome data sets that you all have. So I think that this audience has some of the most amazing data sets in the world, um, and I encourage you all to try to use this. Um, and as I said, we've posted our code on um, the Philab uh, GitHub account, and then also we have a bioarchive preprint, and feel free to email me or Andrew if you want to talk more about it. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we have time for just one question. Oh, okay. Thanks, Emily, that was a great talk. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about uh, finding sequences where neurons participate in multiple sequences in a data set, for example? That's a really good question. So the question is about finding neurons where neurons are shared between different sequences. We've tested this, um, and it works well. There are some subtleties, but they're in the preprint. So, Great. yeah, it does work well in that case. Good question. Thanks very much.